Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Rifles of the World. I'm Mike B, and today we're going to be taking a look at one of my favorites, even though I say that about pretty much everything. But this legitimately is, I love these things. Um, it's the US model of 1917 rifle, chambered in 30 caliber M2 or 30-06. Um, it's commonly referred to as the Eddie Stone, right? And that's not correct because Eddie Stone was just one of the manufacturers. It wasn't actually the model name. Um, there was three manufacturers. You've got Remington, Eddie Stone, and my favorite, Winchester. Winchester made the fewest out of the three. Uh, Remington and Eddie Stone were pretty... Or Eddie Stone was the number one manufacturer, and Remington was almost up there. Did a lot more than Winchester. But uh, anyway, so the history behind this rifle, if you don't know, is this was our main rifle in the First World War. Uh, we couldn't keep up with manufacturing on the 1903s because they were more expensive and a little bit more um, intricate and took longer to produce. Um, so we had been making this rifle, the same exact rifle, just chambered in 303 British, for the um, Commonwealth starting in 1914. It's actually a British design. This is not an American design, which doesn't matter because it's a great design. It's a uh, cock on closing action. The bolt's really weird, but it actually works pretty great. We got the safety right there. That's how you can tell it's uh, it's um, British design because it looks almost like an Enfield safety. This is also called the 1917 Enfield, and that's also incorrect. There's really nothing in here that's similar besides the appearance of the safety that is similar to an Enfield. Oh, I guess cock on closing, but it, the bolt is totally different. The receiver is totally different. It's a totally new concept than the um, than the Enfield rifle or the short magazine Lee Enfield rifle. So that's also an incorrect nomenclature. Uh, these are really common in the U.S. because they produced a ton of these. They only made these from 1917 to 1918, or possibly until like 1919, but pretty sure production stopped right after the uh, ceasefire. But um, anyway, so this was being made starting in 1914, and then when we got involved in the First World War, uh, like I said, the 1903 was a little bit more expensive and um, tedious to produce, took a little bit longer. So they said, okay, well, we've been making this rifle for the British military. Why don't we just uh, retool certain parts of it and rechamber it to 30 6 and keep the rest of the rifle the same and just put, you know, U.S. model of 1917 on it. So that's exactly what they did. And it um, allowed them to keep cranking these out in huge numbers. Um, we're talking millions of rifles produced just in, like, a uh, little less than little less than two years. So that's pretty insane. So, anyway, about 50 to 60% of the Americans were armed with this. Um, some say it's higher, like 75. I, I, the more research I do, the more I see it's like 50 to 60% of the American Expeditionary Force was equipped with this rifle. Um, Sergeant Alvin York, everybody knows who he, who he is, actually did use one of these in his actions that led him to being awarded the uh, Medal of Honor. But he, in all the videos and stuff, it claims to be the, U, the 1903 because it's a U.S. gun. He, um, he claimed this was like the, a British gun or something and they didn't like it as much, even though it holds an extra round because when they rechambered it, they didn't bother changing the magazine design and 303 British is a rimmed cartridge, 30 out 6 is not, so you end up picking up a one round capacity in the magazine, making it a total of 6 rounds in the magazine, and you can put one in the tube for a total of 7 rounds. So that's a pretty interesting thing. It loads the same uh, from the same charges as the 1903 and everything, and uh, it's, a heavy, it's a heavy rifle, it's a little bit longer than the 1903, but uh, I personally like it better. I think it's a lot smoother shooting than a 1903 is. 1903 has got some buck to it. Um, they do recoil quite a bit. And I know I always get the, the people that are hearing that and they go, Oh, it doesn't matter. Recoil doesn't matter. Well, if you shoot this thing with, you know, all day, every day, it, it starts to matter, you know. It's going to start affecting your, your flinchiness. Your, um, your shoulder is going to be hurting and stuff. And it's just uh, whatever. So I take that into consideration. This thing does recoil, but it's not as bad. And it seems to be more smooth. Um, the bolt is just as fast as a 1903, I found. Uh, once you get going with this, it really just, you can let the lead fly and the, the brass, you know, fly to the side of the rifle really fast, um, using the bolt rather efficiently. So what's interesting about this, too, is the 1903 has got the sight, just like most rifles of that time, up on the, um, on the barrel, right? It's a barrel band that goes around right in front of the receiver, but it's a, it's a long eye relief, right? It's like putting a scope on a pistol. This is a short eye relief sight, right? So it's on the rear of the receiver. What we've got here is we've got an actual aperture sight. You can see that right there. Which is kind of the reason for this funky bridge design on the receiver. I, I kind of like it, to be honest with you. I kind of look the, like the look of that. And so you can tell immediately that it's a model of 1917 or 1914. Uh, if you're looking at this in a gun shop, because a lot of these did get sporterized. But I'm going to try to stay on topic here. So, all right, we've got the uh, rear sight, and it does fold up. It's a graduated sight. I think it's battle sighted for like... 
three or 500 yards. I can't tell. I was hitting stuff at three with the battle site pretty effectively, so we'll go with three. 300 yards, and then you can use the uh, ladder effectively past that, um, or even closer. I think it goes down to 100. And then the, the front site's just a really nice, easy to use. Uh, we'll let this kind of focus, hopefully. Come on, baby. Yeah, really the easy to use uh, post right there. You can see that having some focusing issues. Come on, baby. There we go. All right, get a nice close up. So you put the uh, this whole front sight picture fits rather nicely in the um, in the rear aperture, right? So you can see that. That's how it looks, and uh, it's a very easy to use sight. It's I'd say it's about halfway between a battle sight and a target sight. It's not as tight as the uh, M1 because the front sight's a little bit bigger, but uh, it's still not exactly quick, but I think I can hit stuff at a farther distance with one of these than I can a 1903 sight. Um, so that's that. It's got the uh, the full handguard, which is pretty typical of a rifle at that time, and uh, it does take a bayonet. I actually don't have an original bayonet for this, which is odd. I'm going to probably get one this year to show you. But uh, yeah, the bolt is really interesting. It's... Uh, Pretty, uh, pretty unique. That's also a great way to tell that if, you know, if you see the Sporterize at a gun shop, which more than likely if you go into any gun shop in the U.S., you'll see one of these at Sporterize. You can tell just immediately by the bolt that that's uh, model, model 1917 or 1914. More commonly a 17 in the U.S. because it was a 30 out 6 which is a really common caliber. Um, so, yeah, this is obviously, I said Winchester, and um, you can see that right there. They'll be marked like this. It'll say model 1917, Remington, Winchester, or Eddie Stone right there. Same thing, the serial number. Uh, you can see, I didn't even show you the barrel date. Oh, so this thing is dated uh, December of 1917. So it's a, actually pretty early considering I think production started in October or um, somewhere around there in 1917. So it's a pretty early rifle. I doubt it actually went over there and saw service because it's in really good shape and the bore is still immaculate, but who knows. Now these were, oh, sorry about the, I didn't even notice it was all blurry. So a lot of these rifles, in fact, most of them after the first world war were sent to like allied countries like the philippines um the free french used these in the second world war a lot of other countries and actually there were units later on in world war ii once we ran out of 1903s and m1s u.s units that were armed with these too so these things saw extensive service and then they were used in the middle east and they've just been all over the world it's a pretty interesting rifle and uh often overlooked which is why i kind of made this video on it it's not a extensive like detailed this is the person that designed it kind of history just kind of a if you see this in a gun shop you'll know what it looks like complete like this and you'll know that if it doesn't look like this it's cut down and it's not going to be worth that much uh, winchesters are worth a little bit more obviously because they're a little bit less common but um you know these are still affordable and i think i think they're worth they're worth what they uh what they're being charged so it's like right now at the time you're making this video they're worth about five to nine hundred dollars depending on the manufacturer and I think that 900 is probably the absolute cutoff. Um, I'd pay 900 for a Winchester in good shape like this, but that's it. Um, you can usually get Remingtons and other stuff for 60, 600 bucks, that kind of range. And it's not only a great piece of history, but they're great shooters. Um, I had my friend down here from Canada a few weeks ago, and he was shooting this, never shot one before. And out of all the guns that we were shooting, he liked to shoot this one the best because we were standing up, aiming at 600 yards and hitting a target. So... Very accurate, very reliable, fun to shoot, great piece of history. And if you decided to get into World War One reenacting, depending on what unit you portray, totally you're right for that. So, all right, you can tell I like this gun. I usually don't spend this much time rambling. Um, I absolutely, I think it's one of the best bolt action rifle designs ever. Uh, I've been asked on a live stream before, and even in real life, like uh, if you had to pick any gun out of World War One, if you were in World War One and you could pick any main firearm, what would you pick? And this would be it. Out of every country, every firearm, this would be it because of the reliability, the handling. I'm really comfortable with it. The caliber is more than efficient to knock down what you're aiming at, of course. And um, it's just seven rounds is pretty good. It's in between five and ten, which, you know, everybody says ten for the short magazine, Lee Enfield. But I don't like the sights on there, et cetera, et cetera. So this would be my choice. So in case you were going to ask that, which most people do. But um, anyway... I'll quit rambling now and we'll get to it. I'll do my little plug for uh, Patreon and subscription. So um, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And then click the link to my Patreon in the description. Check that out. Become a subscriber for a dollar a month. And you get access to exclusive content that I don't post on YouTube. You get to see a lot of videos early. Um, we do 
um, giveaways, interactive stuff, polls, etc., etc. And you guys can give me ideas for videos that you want to see on there. Um, if not, that's fine. And just subscribe to the channel and keep watching these videos. And if you want to comment, go on to my uh, Facebook page, uh, Mike B on Facebook. You should be able to find that. It's on my, it's on my channel page too, a little Facebook link. Go on there and, uh, we'll have some, we'll have some cool discussions. So thanks for watching everybody and we'll see you next time.